protesters took to the streets outside at Immigration and Customs Enforcement headquarters in Phoenix this morning. Cronkite News reporter Holly Bernstein spoke with DACA recipients and joins us now in the Media Center. Groups such as Mi Familia Vota and Trans Queer Pueblo attended the protest, which started at approximately 9.30 this morning. The group shared their thoughts on President Trump's decision to end DACA. Here to stay. Here to stay. This morning, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals recipients protested in front of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement headquarters following President Trump's decision to end the program. I first uh, came out of the shadows back in 2010 when I was an ASU student. Brandon Mansoya is an Arizona State University alumna who has a younger brother who was also a DACA recipient. I was inspired to making sure that he didn't have to go through the same hurdles that I, that I went through, not knowing if you were going to get deported, not knowing if you were going to finish college. DAC recipient April Garrado says now each of the groups at the protest will host a series of forums to inform their members. But I think now we are gathering to put our thoughts together, process what this announcement means and what it will mean for people with DACA. Montoya says DACA recipients will continue to educate people about who they are. And they will need to know that if they don't take a stand, if they don't call Congress, if they don't engage with their elected officials, people like me will be deported. According to the Department of Homeland Security, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services will deny any uh, any request uh, to renew DACA filed after October 5th, 2017. In the Media Center, Holly Bernstein, Cronkite News. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton also weighed in on the DACA decision, stating that dreamers make the country stronger. And many DACA recipients got together in Phoenix to support each other as the Trump administration's official decision was read. Cronkite News reporter Courtney Malley was there and brings us some of those emotional scenes. In consequences, it also denied jobs to hundreds of thousands of Americans. Emotions ran high Tuesday as dreamers, advocates and supporters gathered in downtown Phoenix to hear the news they knew was coming. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy, commonly known as DACA, has been rescinded by the Trump administration. One of them, Ricardo Zamudo, is a dreamer and says it's a bitter pill to swallow, but the DACA fight will continue. It's shocking and it's painful to hear these things, but when I look into the room and I look at my colleagues and everybody else that's, that's part of this work, uh, I see the, the, the power and the resiliency we've had for a long time. Peter Juarez, communications director for One Arizona, a pro-immigrant advocate organization, said dreamers have the strength to face what may come next. I think all the young people that have grown up in this movement are super prepared and know what to do. They're strong and yesterday is a sad day, but they are ready to move forward with this decision and the planning continues. With their future potentially now laying in the hands of Congress, nearly 30,000 Arizona DACA recipients now face an uncertain future. These things are, are, are not just a political game, it's our lives. And that we need to think of those things as that and, and not a football game that, that we're playing all the time. In Phoenix, Courtney Malley, Cronkite News. The American Civil Liberties Union is joining forces with eight school districts in the Valley with their newest campaign to minimize disciplinary action toward minorities and disabled students. Cronkite News reporter Marcia Opong talked with one of the school districts involved. They like pay attention a lot more like to the students than the past teachers that I've been with. Carlos Diaz is a minority student who's now attending his 10th school. I'll go for high school. His mother, Eliza Diaz, is a parent with the ACLU's Demand to Learn campaign. She says Carlos has a learning disability and hasn't had a lot of luck with the schools he has attended. He's just really had a really tough time um, with accommodations and with the schools providing the services that he needs in order for him to be successful. If A equals 7. 11. Okay. The Demand to Learn campaign is about eliminating the practices that disproportionately impact kids of color, special ed, and ELL students to make sure that they are kept in the classroom, according to campaign manager Luisa Villa. For example, African-American students are eight times more likely to be suspended out of school uh, in our charter high schools here in Phoenix. Uh, Latino students are six times more times to be uh, suspended in a high school here uh, in, in Phoenix. And the Native American students are uh, almost 10 times more likely to be suspended in suburban schools close to tribal communities. Can you see that? Yes. 
Martin Perez Jr., the vice principal of Academia del Pueblo Elementary School, urges everyone in the community to get involved in this campaign to help ensure that students get the future they deserve. Growing up, specifically in middle school, I was suspended several times um, uh, for you know various reasons. Had it not been for my teachers, my school principal, and the support staff at my school, I probably would not be here today. My son is not a failure, and he is going to be a success. We can't let discriminatory practices dictate who our child is going to be or what opportunities our child is going to have. In downtown Phoenix, Marcia O'Connor, Cronkite News. The Rocking Taco Street Festival, hosted by the City of Chandler, takes place later in September. Advertising for margaritas, $2 tacos, and extreme wrestling. But there is something else about the festival that's upsetting some people. Cronkite News reporter Monica Sampson joins us from the Broadcast Center to break down the controversy. The main attraction for the taco festival is extreme wrestling, but not any kind of wrestling. See, the controversy stems from the name itself, hosted by the national organization Extreme Midget Wrestling. Because we find that the M word is a very derogatory word towards people with disabilities. This is what the chapter president of Little People of America objects to, is what's being advertised. But it's the comments that bother Little People of America district director and advocate mother, Gail Blackburn. Sorry, I get choked up, but I mean, there's... That word midget spurns such hatred, just like the N-word does to a certain group. And on the Phoenix New Times Facebook post, people saying, forget the tacos, forget the beer, we just want to see extreme midgets. Cronkite News reached out to the city of Chandler. We received this written statement saying, the city of Chandler is not the sponsor, organizer, or promoter of the event even though it is being held in a public venue. So Cronkite News reached out to the downtown Chandler Community Partnership, the event organizer, who also didn't want to go on camera, but sent us a written statement saying, we have taken measure to remove any reference to the M word in our marketing efforts and our event website. Cronkite News spoke with Tyler Ward, managing partner for Extreme Midget Wrestling, over the phone about the controversy. No, the Washington Redskins didn't change their name, and they're not going to. We're not going to change our name. Oh, you know what? I'm really offended that they what they're doing to white people, the Dallas Cowboys. So everyone's a cowboy and a redneck. Let's call the Dallas Cowboys up to get them to change their name. Mother Gail Blackburn shared why for her this event is more than just a word. It just doesn't need to be. And the city of Chandler had an amazing opportunity to make this right, and they haven't. Because now they're saying, oh, we'll pull the word now. But there's so much hatred out there that even when they're pulling the word, it's still out there. The little people of America so far have said they would like just a public apology. In the Broadcast Center, Monica Sampson, Cronkite News. It's a long way from Flagstaff to Scotland, but one Arizona author has been taking her readers there for some time now. And she took a side trip to Washington where she talked about her work at the National Book Fair. Cronkite News reporter Bailey Vogt has the story from our Washington Bureau. 20 years ago, I shut the door on the past. This may not look like a scene from Northern Arizona, but Flagstaff native Diana Gabaldon said she was inspired by her time living in the Ponderosa Pines of her hometown when she began writing the Outlander series of books. I did do a lot of work in forests, so, uh, you know, the sensory details of what it's like to be in a forest, you know, the animals and the birds that you would see and hear and so forth. These are, of course, different in Scotland, but they occupy the same ecological niches. Gabaldon's book spawned the Outlander TV series, whose third season premieres Sunday on the Stars Network. The success of the series landed Gabaldon an invitation to the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. over the Labor Day weekend. Authors showcase their books, participate in panels, and meet fans of their work. Oh, it's uh, very, very, uh, very flattering. I've done the book festival twice before, back when they were still having it on the mall. And uh, yeah, I've always had a very good time here. Hundreds of fans waited in line as long as an hour to get a quick autograph and interaction with Gabaldon at the festival, which she says is terrific. You know, it's this you know, small but warm moment of connection and so forth. And, you know, you write books to be read, so it, it feels good to know that people enjoy them. <laughs> Even though the Outlander TV and book series are running strong, Gabaldon realizes not everyone may be familiar with it. She has a wager for those potential fans. 
pick it up, open it anywhere, read three pages. If you can put it down again, I'll pay you a dollar. <laughs> so I've never lost any money on that bet. <laughs> In Washington, D.C., Bailey Vote, Cronkite News. And if you lose that wager and get interested in the books, Gabaldon is currently working on the ninth book in the Outlander series. Arizona businesses may be hit hard by this week's DACA decision, especially business owners who are DACA recipients themselves. Reporter Nikirika Amaranye talked to people about their dreams for success and the potential impact of changes in immigration policy. This week, President Donald Trump announced his plan to rescind DACA. The decision sparked protests all over the country, and concerns about the future of DACA recipients, known as DREAMers, were raised. Some people think that they're only going to school. Um, they're working in our workforce. They're contributing to our economy. They're paying taxes. According to a report by pro-immigration groups FWD.US and Center for American Progress, about 91% of DACA workers are employed and 5% own their own businesses. It's a uh, fitness apparel line um, that sort of targets the Hispanic demographic. Shavaria came to the United States from Mexico when she was seven years old and took the chance to start the apparel line as well as a digital marketing company. So with DACA, I was able to do many things that I wasn't able to do as an undocumented youth. I was able to apply for driver's license for the first time, get health insurance. Raina Montoya also started her own business. She says she has tried to secure citizenship in the past. There's been multiple times that I have tried to adjust my status. There is no legal status. She worries what may happen to the five employees of her immigration advocacy group, Aliento, if DACA is repealed. One of my employees is a U.S. citizen as well, so then what's going to happen to his job if all of us get deported? Stephanie Vasquez is the owner of Fair Trade Cafe, another place where DACA recipients have found work. I don't categorize any of my team as DACA or non-DACA. They're human beings, first and foremost. So um, I'm totally going to get emotional. <sighs> because we're messing with people's lives. C suggests that everyone just be a little more empathetic. That it's time for us to wake up. And it's time for us to look beyond our own backyards and to act and to come together and to support and above all, to love. Um. In Phoenix, in Kiriko Marinia, Cronkite News. This fall. I'm so excited. What? <laughs> from the inspiring to the amazing. We're in the presence of history. The compelling. He said, welcome home. It was just a powerful moment. To the astounding. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> and from the breathtaking. This is real. A journey to Mars. To the electrifying. We're going to change the world. All this and more. All this fall. Oh, my God. Following protests that broke out after President Trump's rally in Phoenix, Arizona lawmakers are looking for ways to make protests and public demonstrations safer. Cronkite News reporter Bridget Dowd is in the broadcast center with details on what could be a new bill. Some of those protesters were wearing masks, which made it difficult for police to identify those suspected of assaulting officers. One Arizona representative says when people are able to hide their faces, they're more likely to commit acts of violence and he hopes to change that. This footage shows just a glimpse of the chaotic scene in downtown Phoenix following President Trump's speech. Republican Representative Jay Lawrence says some of the more violent protesters hid their faces with masks. He plans to introduce a bill that would prohibit the use of masks and hoods at future protests. People say, if I'm unmasked, my boss will know who I am. If you are that ashamed, of that for which you are demonstrating, you shouldn't be doing it. Stay home. While Arizona does not yet have a law like this, other states like Alabama and West Virginia have already adopted similar laws. Representative Lawrence says in addition to making it a felony for someone to wear a hood or a mask at a protest, he hopes enhanced charges will come to those who commit crimes while wearing a mask. And Lawrence isn't the only one who thinks unmasking those people could make public demonstrations safer. Don Steinmetz is a former Phoenix police sergeant. When you see people uh, with masks and stuff like that, when a, as a police officer you think of a bank robber or somebody like that generally, so you know that they're concealing it for some kind of bad deed. However, some people are concerned that this ban would violate their constitutional rights, like Phoenix resident Tanya Mendez, who participated in the protest a few weeks ago. 
however people want to dress to a protest, they have the freedom to dress however they want. You know, if people are comfortable with open carry laws in the state of Arizona, why would somebody feel uncomfortable with a mask or being able to remain anonymous? We asked ASU law professor Joseph Rusimano if a law like this would be constitutional. He says if it infringes on the ability to express an idea, it could violate the First Amendment. However, government interest in public safety could outweigh an individual's right to free speech. Lawrence has sent his suggestion to House, Deter House attorneys who are in the process of writing the legislation. He says he'll introduce the bill as his first order of business in January. In the Broadcast Center, Bridget Dowd, Cronkite News. It's back to school time and many teens in Arizona are keeping up with their shot records, including the HPV vaccine. Cronkite News reporter Sierra Delgado shows us why more Arizona teens are getting shots to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Human papillomavirus is a virus that can cause certain cancers and diseases to both girls and boys. For Sandra Kainez, getting her kids vaccinated was worth it. I think it's good to kind of take those blinders off. Um, it's, you know, be proactive and come to the realization that, again, children are going to be children, um, teens are going to be teens, and they're going to do what they want to do at times. And if we can just try and help to prevent them from causing any type of harm to themselves, then might as well do it. Schools in Arizona don't require the HPV vaccine, but according to the Arizona Department of Public Health, 68% of girls and 51% of boys have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine in 2015. Maricopa County nurse Linda Watson explains what happens if a teen does miss a dose. The problem is, is that they're not going to be totally protected, but the good news is, is that even if you get a dose and you don't go back for two years, you can get the next dose and it's still effective. And Dr. Shafiq Tomei wants parents to know that simply getting their child vaccinated can save the family from regrets. This is a vaccine that prevents cancer. And so why wouldn't you give that when it's a simple shot versus a lifetime of, of problems with cancer treatment afterward? Kanyez recommends parents educate themselves about the HPV vaccine. The cancers that are going around and how common it is nowadays, um, the STDs, you know, how common those are as well. Anything that we can do to prevent our kids from, you know, co contracting one of those, whether it be now or in the future. Experts say that parents should worry less about the vaccine being a sex-related issue and more of a cancer prevention issue. In Phoenix, Sierra Delgado, Cronkite News. The CDC recommends kids ages 9 to 12 years old receive two doses of the vaccine and teens 15 and older receive three doses. You've probably seen people riding them down the sidewalk, in the park, or around town. Electric skateboards have become one of the trendiest ways to get around. And one Valley Skate Company is said to leave its competitors in the dust. Although only 21, Levi Conlow is already making huge waves across the skating community. The Grand Canyon University student was walking between classes one day when inspiration struck. Someone flew past me on an electric skateboard, uh, instantly fell in love. I knew I had to have one, uh, looked it up, couldn't afford it, and that started the years. Shortly after, Conlo began making his own boards and founded electric lawn boards along with his friend and classmate, Nathan Cooper. The pair began selling their boards online last year and success was almost instant. In a little over 12 months, the duo have made over $700,000 in revenue and sold over 1,500 boards. But there's more to this blossoming company than meets the eye. Beyond the hard work and success is a very special concept. It's called conscious capitalism, and it's at the core of electric lawn boards. Conscious capitalism is the idea that um, there's something bigger than the business, right? It's, it's about giving back, helping others in need. The two take this message to heart and plan on giving back in a big way this holiday season when they donate 1,000 boards to foster kids throughout the valley. Because for Conlo, it's never been about the money. It's always been about giving back and spreading the hobby that he loves. We focus on the customer, the community, the culture we're developing, and the sales and the numbers, that all comes second. In Phoenix, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. Electric Longboard's signature board, the LS, retails for $429. The Scottsdale Police Department is in the process of upgrading body cameras for its officers. Cronkite News reporter Nicole Gutierrez shows us the improvements. 
The Scottsdale Police Department is currently in the process of replacing their Axon body cameras to an updated version. Axon, formerly known as Taser International, hopes that their cameras continue to reinforce transparency and accountability for the police department and the public. We have recently switched uh, under our contract to what you see on my shoulder here, which is the new Axon Flex 2. Flex 2 cameras record a 120 degree view in HD level. This one's unique because if you have a Flex 2, it's not a body camera that has a lens here that you wear on your chest. It's actually one that powers up a digital video recorder that I can mount on my neck. I can take this off, move in my glasses, my hat, my helmet, motorcycle helmet, anything like that. Flexibility and the placement of the camera allows a better view of any incident. Now, when it comes especially to use of force incidents, we get a much better view with the camera up here on the shoulder. You're, you're getting a better view because you're looking down and because there's a, a wide, wider angle lens uh, with this particular camera than with the old camera. And that view can provide more more information about the incident, but former police chief and now AAC professor Jerry Oliver believes the cameras can and should go further by providing live feeds that would allow real-time feedback. I really think the uh, great opportunity for the use of these cameras have not really been explored. Let's talk about mental health, for instance. Police officers aren't really equipped to deal with many of the mental health issues that they come in contact with. The officers can focus in on the behaviors or the circumstance, um, and professionals can whisper in his ear, so to speak, or give advice as to how to de-escalate that situation or how to deal with that situation. But Scottsdale police are satisfied with the current cameras being able to record interactions for evidence. In this day and age, transparency is, is incredibly important in terms of building relationships with the public. So uh, this department is, is dedicated to making sure that we're as transparent as possible. Scottsdale police will have 140 cameras from Axon and by the end of the calendar year, they will purchase an additional 60 Flex 2 cameras to have the full patrol division in deployment. In Scottsdale, Nicole Gutierrez, Cronkite News. AZ Merit's merit scores have been released and this year's scores show modest improvement over last year's. Cronkite News reporter Holly Bernstein examined the scores to see what they mean for students and schools. Among students in grades 3 through 12, in 2017, 39% of students passed the English language arts, up just 1% from last year. 40% of students passed the math section this year, up 2% from last year. The reading and the writing aspect of it is very difficult for our students. Many of our high school students come in reading at below grade level. At Phoenix's Central High School, only 11% of students pass the AZ Merit math test. 17% passed English language arts. The school has a diverse student population. Some are even refugees. So when they come to us, their backgrounds are varied and their educational levels varied. And the test scores of those students are included in the school's overall rating. Central High School Communications Director Craig Platanik says the scores aren't what they were hoping for. We're disappointed, quite frankly, we're um, our uh, algebra one scores, which are ninth grade scores, uh, fell this year, and we also uh, fell in uh, English language in 11th grade, as did the state. Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas said in a statement, quote, while I am pleased that the scores of students are modestly moving in the right direction, the weight given to AZ Merit has gone beyond its intended use, end quote. Jeff Esposito, the Director of Policy and Programs at Expect More Arizona, is also concerned about modest gains. Esposito says one of the biggest problems in education right now is that everyone lacks a shared vision about where we need to be going. Expect More says they've worked with schools, business leaders, and others to set long-term goals for 2030, called the Arizona Education Progress Meter. We try to keep parents informed about um, what their kids should be learning, how this test works, and uh, especially about how our schools are doing overall through something we call the Arizona Education Progress Meter, which are eight indicators to, from everything from early childhood on through post-secondary that really tell us if we're building an excellent education for every child. Until then, teachers like Davis are looking for the silver lining in the data. And they score 50 percent, which on a standardized is considered failing, but th that student walks away knowing 50% more than what they did coming in.
This school year, districts will be able to choose alternative testing to AZ Merit. In the Broadcast Center, Holly Bernstein, Cronkite News. Some consider the arts a luxury, but to the city of Phoenix, they're much more than that. And Kirika Marigny looked into the industry that contributes millions of dollars and thousands of jobs to the economy. Lots of very beautiful paintings, uh, statues. A day at the museum. I think probably the most interesting to me were the old artifacts. William Harshman is one of many people who spend his time and money at local art exhibits. Today, his spending is directly to the museum. So far, just the admission. But Scottsdale Museum of the West director and CEO Mike Fox says that oftentimes, visitors spend money on more than just tickets, called indirect spending. They buy dinners before or after the event. They pay for um, baby care. A recent report reveals that the arts generated over $400 million in 2015, up from $300 million in 2012. The study, conducted by Americans for the Arts, looks at the economic impact of nonprofit culture organizations and their audiences in cities across the country. The findings of the report were presented at the Building a Prosperous Phoenix Through the Arts event, where Mayor Greg Stanton spoke about how the arts even affects his job. The arts make a city in so many ways. I can't recruit great businesses to Phoenix if we're not in a fun, interesting place to live. The report also stated that the industry supports over 12,000 jobs in the city. This includes any job that contributes to the experience, such as performers, exhibit workers, and even valet parkers. It's a phenomenal uh, ripple effect throughout our communities because what do they do with their money? They go and they spend it. In Scottsdale, in Kiriko Amarania, Cronkite News.